Hello, this is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the world's least original composer. And I really mean it. This is so much fun. And I, I, I'm not trying to be snide about it. I'm really not. His name is Isotaro Sugata from Japan. And, you know, it's okay. So the guy had not an original fiber in his body. I mean that in the nicest possible way, because there is incredible joy for us music lovers to be gotten in hearing a composer who is totally derivative. I mean, we've spent so much time learning to love the great music by numerous composers, and we know it, and we have it in our heads, and then we hear somebody else come along, and he's just just taking it and doing his own thing with it. And we recognize it, we hear it, and we know it. And it makes us feel so smart and just so knowledgeable and and and, and sophisticated, doesn't it? I mean it's just it's it's just a a snobgasm. And if you want to have a snobgasm, then Sugata is your guy. Because Everything that he wrote sounds like somebody else. I mean it. It's wonderful. Only with Japanese folk melodies. But you know what the something else is that he's putting the Japanese folk melodies to. And thank God this is a Naxos recording so I can play samples and I can show you exactly what I mean. And we are going to have just a blast for the next 10 minutes or so. Just sit back and get ready. So... First, let's talk a little um, about the guy. He lived from 1907 to 1952, which was, you know, the period when sort of the first Japanese Western style composers were, were getting going. And he was Western style with a vengeance, but he was not Western style in a in a backwards looking way. He wasn't trying to write, you know, Mozart, <laughs> thank God, in 1950. 40 and 50. He was he was writing Hindemith and Stravinsky, primarily Stravinsky, like like a zillion other composers were doing, right? I mean, I you can't claim that that Sugata is is in any way doing something. I mean, Aaron Copeland was writing Stravinsky and and Harold Shapiro was writing Stravinsky and and Boris Blocher was writing Stravinsky. I mean, everybody was doing it. Karl Orff based his whole career on Stravinsky. So yeah, I mean, Stravinsky was big and lots of people imitated him. So you can't you can't blame Sugata particularly but the point with Sugata is that his imitations are are just, first of all, unbelievably flagrant. And you can figure out exactly what piece he's imitating. It's not a sort of general stylistic parameter. It's specific works of Stravinsky only with Japanese folk melodies. Like I said, it's, it's just wonderful. And of course, when he was studying as a composer, he was imitating Hindemith because when you're learning your trade, you study Hindemith. Hindemith's the guy who you, you imitate when you want to learn counterpoint, for example. Stravinsky wasn't so good for that. Hindemith's great. So let's listen to some samples and you'll see exactly what I mean. The first piece on this disc, which is performed by the, the Kanagawa Philharmonic Orchestra under Kazuhiko Komatsu, very nicely, I might add, and nicely recorded, is his Symphonic Overture, Opus 6, which is 16 minutes and 31 seconds uh, in length which makes it about 15 minutes and 31 seconds longer than it needs to be. But that's okay. It really doesn't make any difference. Oh, and look who's here. Look who's here. Come here, sweetie. Some of you have asked to see the cat. And here is your moment. He, she loves derivative, derivative music by unknown Japanese composers. You see, when I was playing Fort Wengler's Beethoven's Ninth, she was nowhere to be found. But now, say hello. Hi there. Her name is Pipo. I didn't name her. My nephew did. She was a stray. She was living in our backyard for almost two years, completely abandoned, which I find absolutely unaccountable. I mean, disgraceful. We live in a, in a park, you know, surrounded by a park. And she'd been spayed. Somebody had bought her and put money into her and then just dumped her, which was horrifying. I mean, absolutely horrifying. And she lived behind our house for a couple of years. And we went and sort of lured her back. And one day she just said, hey, screw the woods. I'm moving in. And she walked into the house and she never left. 
So nine years later, 10 years later, now she's about 15, here she is. And you hear her running around and making noise and doing all kinds of stuff while we're doing these talks. But I thought you might want to meet her. She is an R&B fan. She's not really a classical music person. Thank you for joining us. Take care, sweetie. Okay, here you go. Okay, there. And now I'm gonna be covered with hair for the rest of the day, so excuse me. She sheds like a mother, it's unbelievable. Now, where were we? Sugata, oh yes, <laughs> pardon me. Um, uh, Isotaro Sugata, yes, the world's most derivative composer. So here's an example of his Hindemith phase, which only lasted about a year. This was written in, in 1939, and uh, you'll see exactly what I mean. He's doing the counterpoint thing, courtesy of Mr. Hindemith. Go! See what I mean? You got it? Now, again, million composers sounded just like Hindemith. He wasn't special in that way. The only thing I think that's really special about him is how well he does it and how obvious it is that he's doing it. And like I said, that's not that's not to denigrate his accomplishment at all. He's obviously very talented and is having a blast, and so do we. Next, he wrote, there are these two ballet things. I'm going to play the second one. One is called Peaceful Dance of Two Dragons, and the other is Ballet Music, The Rhythm of Life, that we're going to hear a couple, a couple extracts from. These are unbelievable. The pieces in question that are the models for these works are the early Stravinsky ballets, particularly the Firebird and Petrushka with a bit of the Rite of Spring thrown in just for fun, and you'll, you'll tell where. Here's the, the first movement, which is marked Mysterioso, from The Rhythm of Life, it's basically the introduction to the Firebird combined with the final scene from Petrushka. I'll give a listen, you'll see what I mean. There you go, right? That da 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 You're just waiting to hear a couple of trumpets go da 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 you know, like at the end of Petrushka, but he's doing his own thing. It's 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 quite wonderful. You hear that little prowly thing underneath, it's kind of like the Moors the Moors scene. It's it's just amazing. And next we go to the the next the next scene, the Andante and Scherzando, the middle movement from the rhythm of life. Now this is this is basically, it starts with that, that sort of trumpet thing in part two of, of, of the Rite of Spring, that da 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 wump, 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 you know, the, the Stegosaurus battle, although that, the wump, wump and the Stegosauruses don't show up. What shows up is the fourth tableau of Petrushka <laughs> instead. It's just, it's, but with Japanese folk tunes, it's, it's, it's great. I got to play it here. You just got to hear it.
there you are, right? I mean, it's it's delicious. It's absolutely delicious. I get so much fun listening to this myself because of my own pleasure, but also for playing it for friends and saying, guess who that is? And, you know, and just watching their jaws hit the ground, you know, when they listen to it. Finally, the last thing on this disc is called Dancing Girl in the Orient. Oh, you know what you're getting there, don't you? Um, from Sketches of the Desert, Sweet in Oriental Style, Opus 10 from 1941. Now, this could be by Rimsky anyone. <laughs> I mean, you know, anybody. Here, here's the dancing girl in the Orient. And of course, one of the, the funniest things about this is that you've got a guy, a composer, who's in the Orient. He lives in the Orient. He's, he's Oriental. Asian now, we say, right? But you know what I mean. Why on earth does he feel any need to imitate Russian fake Orientalist music when, when he can just do his own thing and have it himself? I mean, there's something so weird about, you know, e even somebody conceiving the necessity or desire to do something like that. I mean, here he is writing fake Western music about the fake Orient, and he's Japanese. Go figure. It's just one of those, those wonderful things that you come across if you keep listening. So that's what I encourage you to do. In this case, to Isotaro Sugata. This disc is priceless. It's absolutely priceless. And you will have a blast with it. I promise you. Thank you and take care. <laughs>